Today's guest is Thias Russomano. Thias Russomano is a Brazilian doctor and scientific researcher specializing in space medicine, space psychology, biomedical engineering, telemedicine, and telehealth. From Beyond Media, I'm Felix Tachinsky, and this is Humanity and Beyond. How are you doing today? I'm fine. <laughs> Enjoying the lockdown. <laughs> Enjoying it? Yeah, well, <laughs> if you cannot change something, it's better to adapt. <laughs> That's a very good point. Would you like to introduce yourself to our audience? Yes, I can introduce myself. My name is um, Thais Russomano. I'm a medical doctor, originally uh, from Brazil. I studied medicine in Brazil. Uh, but I, I did my master's in the United States in, space, in aerospace medicine and my PhD here in London at King's College in space physiology. Uh, so I call myself a space life science scientist or a space doctor. And um, I've been working in this field for a long time now, uh, over 30 years. I've been uh, researching and teaching in different universities uh, and um, not just here in Europe, or not just sorry, not just here at, in England at King's College, but also in other universities here in Europe, in Finland, in Germany, in Lisbon, in Portugal, in Lisbon, in Portugal, and also in Brazil. So I'm very active in terms of my uh, academic life. Mm. But at the same time, I established uh, about two years ago a company called the Nova Space. It's a British company and um, that deals with um, space, aviation, other extreme environments, and, um, and telehealth, digital health. So this is, uh, let's say, the, these are the four main areas of uh, Innova Space. Uh, we, we do research, development, innovation, technology transfer, uh, education, higher for, let's say, universities, undergrad and grad courses and lectures and webinars and so on and also outreach projects for student, uh, school, school children and teachers. You've got a lot on your plate, for sure. I, I, I saw that you were a visiting professor at four separate learning institutions. How do you manage that or what are your, with, with everything else that you have going on? It takes lots of organization and discipline. <laughs> but uh, yeah, well, it's under the same umbrella you know, of areas of uh, activity, so it much, makes much, uh, my life much easier. Uh, so it depends on, let's say, the, the university. I'm responsible, for example, uh, for modules, you know, uh, one week or one or two weeks. And um, for in others, I'm um, more related to research and um, stab establishment of uh, space life science experiments and the telehealth programs. So because it's under the same umbrella, it is uh, it's easier somehow to interconnect things and. Uh, find time for everything. They are not all active at the same time, so that's oh, a okay. <laughs> So it is, um, I'm involved with projects in Brazil in two different universities, uh, and also I teach uh, two graduate courses there, but again, it is like a, a week of lectures for these graduate courses, a uh, specialization course in the area of uh, aerospace physiology and medicine. So it is more like, say, restricted in terms of time. And uh, the research that I developed in the other two universities are also related to space, uh, extreme environment. And uh, in one of them, in fact, it's a very interesting project because it's related to isolation, uh, isolation confinement and mental health during the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, we are always bridging with uh, what happens to astronauts in space during space missions in terms of their psycholo psychology, how they adapt to a confined and isolated environment. And I'm assuming that Innova Space has maybe been working on something like that. I, I was going to ask what Innova Space has been working on in general. Since you said everything's under the same umbrella, is it really focused on uh, the mental and physical health of people in space? Yeah, well, Innova Space is, um, it, well, it's it's bigger than that somehow, no? because it is, it is, um, uh, it's a company that uh, I, 
briefly mentioned in my introduction, it, is, uh, it covers four areas, uh, what we call space life sciences, which is related to the human presence in space or human, uh, uh, spa uh, human exploration of uh, space. Uh, also, uh, aerospace uh, medicine and physiology, so it's aviation medicine and uh, other extreme environments like diving, you know, climbing a mountain, <laughs> stuff like that, and telehealth and digital health. So these are the four main areas. And then under these areas, we, we devel develop projects that could be, uh, let's say, related to telehealth and digital health, could be the establishment of a, a telehealth device or product in an area of the globe, or a program for a specific region as well. Uh, and in the area of space, uh, we have uh, basically uh, projects in education and outreach and also research and development innovation. I'm very happy <laughs> to go wide to establish in two years. <laughs> yeah, well, I, if anybody could do it, certainly you, just reading about everything you're involved in. Yeah. My organization that I work for is particularly interested in Mars colonization. So uh, is there anything that relates to medicine and deep space travel or to long-term habitation of Mars that you guys are working on? Any projects that relate? Yeah, you know, no, for sure. We, we have projects in um, uh, uh, emergencies in space, like, uh, like say, let's say, cardiac arrest in space. So we, I have a group of uh, uh, medical doctors that are part of you know, space. Uh, and we've been working on that for a long time. In fact, if you, if you search in the literature, we've, pub if we've published a lot of papers uh, in this area, even uh, book chapters, and we come up with some guidelines for CPR in space. And this, of course, is applied to, to the trip to Mars. <laughs> now, if it happens, I hope not. But we, and, uh, and we, in some of these uh, cases, uh, in some of our studies, we simulated uh, CPR on, on Mars you know, during a, what's called hypogravity environment. So that's uh, one area that we concentrate. We also had some studies uh, related to the walking pattern in, in hypogravity environments. So not just Mars, but also the moon. Uh, CPR also studied the moon and Mars, in fact, the two hypogravity environments. We have um, also, of course, education. You know, so lectures, webinars in, in this area, specifically related to trips to Mars, both considering the, uh, the, the human body in terms of uh, the, the body itself and the mind, so physiology and um, psychology. Uh, and we have um, a, a specific project for outreach project, which is a global project called Kids to Mars, uh, in which we are we are involving symbolically, you know, because you cannot do that, uh, involve the whole globe. It's impossible. Right. <laughs> uh, it's not impossible. It would be extremely difficult. Uh, so we are symbolically uh, representing the globe, you know, every single country that is recognized by the United Nations. So the total is 193 countries through questions from kids, uh, boys and girls between six and 18 years old. And um, we have a, a current 45 countries that are already part of this project. Of course, because it's questions and answers, and the answers come from uh, space scientists, experts in different areas of uh, space exploration, uh, analog astronauts, and so on. We created also what is, we call the video encyclopedia, which is basically all the questions and answers, but divided by topic, uh, not per country. You know? So if, if you want to search, for example, I don't know about the, uh, Pets on Mars, can I have my pet on Mars? <laughs> uh, then we have an area for animals and plants on Mars. So all the questions from kids that uh, were related to that specific topic will be under this um, area of the encyclopedia. So it is quite an impressive program because, um, and because <laughs> it is also related well, well, uh, one of the ideas of you know, novel space, you know, is the, the, pr the principle behind you novel know, space is space without borders. So we want to make it uh, space extremely popular, even in the countries that are not, um, let's say, traditionally connected to uh, human space exploration. 
they might have space programs like satellites and so on, but not necessarily uh, programs related to the exploration of space by humans. And this is our main focus, our main area. So you, you want to be extremely global, extremely inclusive, extremely diverse. And um, so Kids to Mars is a very good project in the sense that it really represents that. Give face and voice to, to people from countries that are not uh, traditionally involved in the, in the exploration of space. I'm assuming one of those questions is about what you would wear on Mars. For that, of course, the child would ask what you would wear on Mars. I'm going to ask, how's the gravity loading countermeasure skin suit uh, project going? This was a project, in fact, that was I was a part of a team of supervisors, a PhD supervisors at King's. It was led by another colleague. And um, uh, two, I, I was part of two, uh, let's say, PhD studies, PhD uh, thesis. <laughs> Sorry, right. it escaped me. And um, so it was tested in different, let's say, ways in terms of uh, uh, how it could prevent or, or, or at least diminish the elongation of the spine in space because without gravity, you become taller in space. So it would be a way to try to decrease this, this decrease the increase mm -hmm. in, 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 the, in the spine length. You know? And... Um, because it caused lots of back pain for in astronauts. One of the studies were related to that. And the other study was more related to the uh, muscle physiology, biomechanics, uh, cardiovascular uh, physiology as well, during different types of um, uh, exercise, comparing the, the, the skin suit with the other, let's say, uh, other situations using a body suspension device. So it was, um, that was my, I say, my contribution. I was part of this team of supervisors. Uh, in each study, we had uh, two or three supervisors. I mean, we don't know how, what the effects on Mars would be since it's not microgravity, it's uh, 0.3 Gs. We don't know if the, how the spine would be affected yet, I suppose. But because obviously, like I said, main focus is on Mars colonization. We're just wondering what would be the, what would be required to wear to reduce the amount of detrimental effects on health if you're you know living on mars for not not just a 30-day mission but like two to four years or decades i uh, know it's very difficult everything is basically a question mark in the sense you know, and you have to consider that you are not like say being transferred from your uh, how you are now here on earth you know your, your body now here on earth you are not going to be um transferred let's say or travel to Mars in a split of a second, then you get there and then you have high pull gravity. You know? There is this trip of six, eight months to Mars. And then during this period, you are going to be exposed to microgravity and radiation and all the psychosocial issues that you can, um, that you have to also to deal with during your trip, you know, in a confined, isolated place, you know, a dangerous mission. Um, we also have uh, things related to the circadian rhythm that will be completely disrupted because there is no sun sunshine and sunrise as you have here on Earth. So the 24 hour uh, period, let's say, is disrupted. So we, we, you are, when you get to Mars, you are going to be a different being. You, know? you are going to be a different human being. And then you have to face the, uh, somehow the hostile place of Mars, the environment of Mars which is uh, not just gravity, it's the uh, lack of oxygen. So 95-96% night, night five, night of the atmosphere on Mars is, um, is of um, carbon dioxide. And uh, you have a very thin atmosphere because the barometric pressure is really very uh, low if compared to Earth. It's extremely low. Uh, the temperature is, is also low. It's very cold in general. Minus 60, minus 6 something. You have sandstorms. So it is, uh, it is to, to come from a six, eight month of uh, a very different, let's say, environment, the microgravity of space and radiation, deep space radiation affecting your body or mind, and then get to this place in which you have to function properly, you know, to, uh, to keep uh, you not, not just alive, but healthy enough to. To continue your mission and to, 
survive your mission. So it's, it's, it is a, a huge challenge. When people ask me, oh, uh, you think that we are gonna get to Mars one day? Uh, I always say, well, we are on Mars. We know how to get there. It's not a mystery. We have rovers there. So to explore Mars is not a, a mystery. The mystery is, can, will, would you have enough um, uh, knowledge in a space like science, in space physiology, space psychology, space nutrition, space pharmacy, space uh, medicine, to get to Mars and, uh, and uh, survive there for a couple of months or, or, or a year or two years, or as you were saying, maybe one day, decade. So the, 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 the questions uh, are pretty much related to, to my area of uh, study, which is, which is uh, medicine, medicine or health. No, it, uh, it's not just medicine, as I, I was mentioning, psychology, nutrition, pharmacy, and so on. So there are many areas that uh, uh, are important to, to study and understand, keep someone healthy happy and alive <laughs> astronauts who are not happy do not work as well we'll be right back we just want to thank all our listeners and especially our supporters without you all this would not be possible the absolute best way you can help us is by sharing us on social media if you really like what we are doing you can support us on patreon that's patreon.com slash humanity and beyond I, I think you were cited on it first. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. It was uh, you were working on a way to analyze blood in space through the earlobe, arter sorry, I still ar arterialized blood technique. And uh, can you explain the process to me? And why haven't we developed a way to monitor blood in space before? Because we've been in space for half a century. It feels like we should have, I don't know, developed ways to monitor one's health a bit better. Yeah. Yeah, it, we went up uh, first time, you know, we went into space in 1961. You know, so it's, it is really, really long time. Okay, so uh, uh, the blood collector, let me explain uh, how it, uh, you know, the idea behind you know, how it uh, started. I was doing my PhD here at King's College and my area, you know, uh, or I say that I was concentrating my studies uh, was the, how the lungs, how lungs, uh, the respiratory system, functions in microgravity, in this case, in a microgravity simulation. And um, you, you, we use lots of different techniques and also stressors, we call it stressors like uh, exercise or hypoxia. Hypoxia, when you, you have a, a decrease in the amount of uh, oxygen that you either you breathe in, so the percentage is lower, or the atmosphere has a low barometric pressure, so the pressure of oxygen in your lungs uh, could, is lower. No? And I had to collect blood from the arteries. So when you collect blood normally, when you go to the hospital, you collect blood from your veins. And in general, it's a very simple technique. You know anyone, not anyone, but you know, people do that very, very easily. But when you have to collect from your arteries, it is uh, because it will give a better information regarding the gases in your body, like oxygen, CO2, pH as well. We have to uh, puncture an artery. And in general, we puncture one that is more superficial, which is in our wrist, how to say, the, the, the needle, and then puncture the artery. But this is a technique that hasn't been used in space. There are some risks associated, it's very painful, in fact. Uh, we can use a, a, an anesthetics, but normally, it is, if you don't, it's very painful. And um, so it, ha it, is, it hasn't been perf uh, conducted in space, uh, this technique. And when I was doing my PhD, uh, I had to use the earlobe, which is the arterialized uh, blood, to collect the blood, which is very similar to the one in the artery. This technique of the arterialized earlobe uh, blood, it, it was developed many, many years ago, in 1944. So they established for the first time this type of collection. So it was not me that developed that. <laughs> it is, so I was just using this technique. And then I try to compare my results with the results in space. And then after trying to find that in the literature, I realized that there was no arterial blood collection in space. This technique then could be used in space because it's much easier than to collect blood direct from the artery. 
you arterialize the lobe with a massage and the vis dilating cream. Make a small cut, collect the blood, and then you analyze the blood. Uh, here on Earth, that's not a huge problem because um, even if you, when you collect the blood, there is a kind of, <laughs> let's say that sometimes the blood is, um, it drops a bit, or it can contaminate the environment in a spacecraft. You know? So the idea then came to me that, oh, I can develop a blood collector can, that can be used in space or, or here on Earth, which we standardize the technique. So the astronaut would, would arterialize the air lobe with massage and the base dilating cream, clean it up, put the blood collector, and then collect the blood. So the cut of the, the ear lobe and the collection of the blood would be uh, in this, uh, let's say, in this, um, it's a kind of special syringe, let's call it like that, which, uh, which standardize the technique and allow the collection of the blood from the ear lobe without uh, contaminating the environment and without contaminating the blood. That I'm contaminating the sense that if it's in contact with the air and I'm me measuring gases, the gases in the air, like CO2 and oxygen, will contaminate my sample, and it will change the values of that I'm uh, trying to analyze. I thought it was a good thing to do, so it was one of the spin-offs of my thesis. We started with a very big <laughs> blood collector, it was like almost 600 grams, and after many studies, and, uh, and then we tested in so many different ways, uh, with volunteers exercising, or during microgravity simulation, in parabolic flights, in um, in hypoxia again, we 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 did lots and lots of studies, and um, and then it was decreasing, let's say, <laughs> the, the size of the size, blood collector. Yeah. Now it's a very small one, like uh, 18 grams, and it can put in your pocket. and very small. Cannot be smaller than that, I think, because. Now you have to rotate, you have to, to, to use your hand to do it. And if it's too small, then you, it's not that, let's say, comfortable. You, you lose a bit then. But at 18 grams, it's still tactile enough that it's usable. It is very, very, very. I, I, just, write, I just wrote a chapter that has been published and it's open access. So anybody can um, uh, read this chapter for free. And it's the, exactly that what I'm telling you, is the evolution of the blood collector from the first studies, pre-blood collector, in fact. Then with the development of the blood collector, then all the tests, and uh, some tests, in fact, not just with um, healthy volunteers in a lab, but also with um, patients in, in, uh, in different situations, I, ICUs, and uh, a study that was done in, um, in Spain. And another study that was done in Brazil with patients from a hemodialysis cl clinic. So there is a, there, there is not there is um, also this possible use here on Earth, not just for space. It was meant to be developed for space, but there is this uh, let's say possible transfer of technology from space to Earth based on on the application here. I mean, I always assumed that there was a bunch of tests to measure someone's health in space, but I, I didn't realize that we had like no easy way to get, art I, I didn't realize the importance of arterial blood and that we had no way to collect it in space. Is there anything like n that is, uh, that you that you s would say is necessary for us to develop in or so once again, to do long, long term deep space missions, Mars or regardless, what what is necessary? Like, do do we need to bring a, an MRI machine, for example, all the way with the astronauts, with the first crew, or something? Or you no, know, ideally, you know, of course, you should have a kind of um, a small ICU and a small kind of uh, uh, image uh, lab. You know? <laughs> um, uh, I don't know. It is it is um, it is a combination, let's say, of what is what doctors would you like to have in space and what is feasible in terms of not just size and weight, but also in terms of the engineering, you know, how to install or, or maintain uh, sophisticated equipment. So we rely a lot on telehealth, you know, digital health, which is good. But as you said uh, very wisely, if we do not have ways to, to have a uh, MRI done in space, how can you send it back to Earth? No? 
we need to have a way to collect the data first. And this for sure is, is, a, is a huge question mark. There is very recently now, uh, I say recently, uh, maybe the last 10 years, uh, it was identified that the, the pressure in the brain or the intracranial pressure of astronauts increase. And um, one way to, to see that is to, uh, let's say, a puncture of the spine collect to, to check the pressure and, um, and to collect the spinal fluid as well. We could do that. But it is also a technique that um, people are afraid to perform in space. And um, so it hasn't been done uh, in space. So uh, there are ways to, to try to measure the inter intracranial pressure in space, but it has to be indirect ways. So, and there is, as you say, said, there is no MRI there, to, as far as I know, uh, to check the, the brain of the astronauts. So I think that all that, um, it is, it's very tricky, you know. Uh, we talk about uh, developing, uh, or no, not developing, sorry, uh, investing in long-term trips like Mars and or to establish human presence on the moon. But the main, main restriction is what we do not know in relation to the body and the mind in space. Uh, you know, and I think that it is an area that should be, if that's the case, if that's one of the goals of, space exploration is to have human space exploration, then this area has to be more popular. <laughs> it has to be studied uh, in many different centers in the world. Uh, space agents uh, should dedicate more money to that as well. And um, because without that knowledge, we are stuck here. Uh, could be the final decision or let's, be, let's, let's, um, let's say stay on Earth. And that would be it. But uh, that's not what I hear. No, people want to go to Mars, uh, space agencies, and, uh, and now the private sector as well, no, space companies, they say, oh, let's go to Mars, or let's have a, a base on the moon, or, and so on and so forth. So if that's the case, we need to know more about humans in space, and um, we need to have more women flying, because uh, it's... Uh, I think that we have about 580 astronauts, roughly, and 11% of them uh, is, um, are female astronauts. We do not have kids in space, we don't have teenagers in space, we do not have uh, very few old people. Um, one of them it was John Glenn that traveled when he was 77, I think. Yeah, 77 on STS-96. Yeah. So the, he was I think, the oldest one to go into space. We have astronauts in the, 50, in the year 50s. But again, you know, we, need, um, we need to have a better picture. We need to understand more about reproduction in space. We want to colonize Mars, and so we are going to be sending babies <laughs> all the time. I don't think so. And um, I think that this is something that has to... Uh, to stop being a taboo, you no, know, and uh, we need to have we need to be talking about um, reproduction in space and uh, how we are going to colonize uh, ma the Mars or, or the Moon, and and, it, and then it it opens if humans are present on, on on the Moon or on Mars, then it opens up to this field uh, just by having humans there. It opens up to a huge number of uh, different areas, uh, engineering, architecture, and, and so on and so forth. No, everything will be uh, then um, will become like say somehow an area of interest, because wherever humans go, you know, everything that we need, everything that we know, that uh, let's say somehow makes our life possible and comfortable, we would like to have there. No? That actually, actually is really nice. My last question is. Uh, if you would like to tell me about your time at the Space for Women Network at the at the United Nations, where you work as a network member. Yes, yes, I, I'm. Um, I mean, this um, uh, mentorship program. It is. Um, it's a group of uh, 35, I think, women from different uh, areas of the world, uh, with pro with 
women that of course are linked to space in different areas somehow they could be a space lawyer could be like me a space doctor could be someone in, um, in, in physics also physics and so on so it's uh, different uh, let's say areas of space not just uh, medicine and my field specific but space in general and uh, the idea is to uh, uh, use let's say these uh, mentors you know, to uh, work in a way you now integrate as a network and also create uh, projects that would uh, empower ladies or girls uh, to 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 follow uh, this path you know to, to to be more let's say to be to feel comfortable to feel more um uh, to have this uh, let's say this um uh confidence that they can follow uh, their dreams if they they want to be linked to space that they have a career a path uh, to also to as i said interconnect all these ladies now in a way that we could uh, uh, motivate not just not just empowering ladies and girls but also uh, even ourselves in terms of creating a more a, a better presence in our countries or in, or in, even internationally uh, of how um, women should be seen and the opportunities that you can then um, raise for women to to explore to, to work in, in space it's a very good initiative i think i have um, three mentees you know, that uh, work with me and we have two projects uh, one of them is kids to mars because it's uh, it's always a boy and a girl from um, different countries you no know, or all these countries let's say and also a project specific project of knowledge space that's called valentina uh, valentina was born let's say before uh, not the person valentina the oh. idea of the project was born before this initiative of the United Nations is a UNUS initiative. Um, but um, uh, so when when um, Innov Space was established, we stepped one of the projects, one of the outreach projects was called Valentina in honor to the to the first lady in space, you know, Valentina Tereshokova from uh, uh, from Russia. Uh, and uh, because of the name as well, no, Valentina means valent, means you know, that has, you have uh, courage. And um, and Valentina is basically a reflect reflects sorry very well what this uh, uh, initiative, uh, you know, say initiative of uh, a space for women uh, does. You know, it is very the, the, the say the goals are very similar. So me, uh, I invited these uh, three uh, mentees. Uh, to participate in the project, Jen, Lizanne, and Marcella, and we are working very hard with the Kids to Mars and the Valentina to, and also of course interconnect, uh, interconnecting, sorry, these uh, other mentors to participate in the projects and to create this network and so on. I know I said that was the last question, but I just wanted to ask you, so I know you've been on ESA's um, micro uh, zero gravity fly i don't know what it's called the plane parabolic flight the parabolic flight would you go on a uh virgin galactic is uh, will probably have its uh per well it's a parabolic fl it's a parabolic flight but it's a parabolic suborbital flight by invitation especially because i don't know i'm sure that i don't have the money to pay for the ticket but uh, <laughs> if i get the invitation i i will go you know the parabolic flights were excellent i think that i, I participate in two campaigns and believe me, because I, I was um, working in, in with space and, and in the space area for so long, and uh, I had a thesis, a uh, PhD thesis using microgravity simulation, so on. But I had never experienced microgravity. So the first in the first parable of the my first of the first flight, in the first campaign that I participated, when I floated for the first time, what crossed my mind was, this is microgravity. <laughs>